Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar on South Africa's automotive industry, where a panel of industry experts will discuss how the auto industry can navigate global and domestic risks while embracing new opportunities. Today's webinar is sponsored by Metair Investments, SEW Eurodrive, and Hellerman Titan. We thank them for making this event possible. Before we begin, please be aware that we've enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The facilitator will pick out themes in the questions and answer as many of them as possible throughout the discussion. To encourage interaction, we've also enabled the chat function so you can network with the panelists via the chat box. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please don't post any questions in the chat box, though, as we might miss them. You can post all your questions into the Q&A. Please be aware we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Dwayne Newman, a South African partner of tax advisory EY. He's a respected business consultant with expertise in the fields of environment of government grants, rather, tax incentives and customs and excise. Dwayne will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Justin Barnes, Manufacturing Ambassador at TWIMS, Paul O'Flaherty, CEO of Metair Investments Limited, and Beth Dealtree, Head of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at the National Association of Automotive Components and Allied Manufacturers, or NARCAM. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Dwayne Newman, to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Dwayne. Thanks, Sharon, um, and good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the automotive industry is one of the most globalized industries um, around with um, supply chains in many, many jurisdictions. I remember having discussions uh, with colleagues around the world which said, you know, it's really hard to work out the origin of a car these days because the parts come from um, all over the world. Um, we, we've got a time where the, I suppose, the global world has got lots of, I suppose, geopolitic tensions, lots of climate tensions. We're going through lots of um, election times, so that a, a lot of uncertainties are impacting the industry. Uh, we've got the industry really struggling to recover um, from COVID, so where the total global manufacturing uh, volumes of cars was around about 97 million. Now, 2023, I think it was about uh, 94 million. So again, the industry is really, really struggling um, to, to recover to those volumes of, 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 of pre-COVID. Um, then we've got, I think, a lot of global tensions between a lot of global players and a lot of global um, uh, centers of the automotive industry, um, China, um, USA, and Europe. And we've seen some recent um, announcements um, by the US of increasing the tariffs um, on um, EV cars from China. We found uh, Europe just recently announced some, um, I suppose, countervailing duties from EVs from China as well, ranging between 17 and 38 um, percent. Um, um, so again, so, so it's a really interesting time to be in the automotive um, industry. Also, we've got um, some interesting opportunities in Africa. Um, I was looking at the stats um, that come out of uh, NAMSA in terms of from the, the export manual. Um, so initially, I think we all know Europe is our biggest um, export destination for uh, automotive ve vehicles. But one of the little bits of information I didn't really know that the second biggest actually happens to be Africa. Um, so the, the real question for all of us, is there a bigger opportunity uh, for the automotive industry, as in the OEMs and also the component manufacturers, can we make that um, African market uh, even even bigger for even bigger for us? So even though that the 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 total footprint of cars made in Africa today only sits at about a million vehicles, which is about one percent of global production, maybe there's a bigger opportunity for us with all these global tensions and some of these um, new rules that have been put on place on um, in various jurisdictions. We see some really bold moves from Europe um, with the EU Green Deal, uh, with about you know, over, a, I suppose, 500 million euros of support going into industry. Um, and also the Inflation Reduction Act um, having also a big impact in the automotive industry uh, uh, in the US. So 
for us in 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 South Africa, the the question is how how do all these developments um, you know, impact us? There's obviously risks to the industry, but also maybe really large opportunities that need to be taken advantage of. So today, um, yeah, hopefully we'll be talking through those risks and opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, I'll be asking the first question to I mean Justin Barnes. I mean Justin Barnes is been uh, obviously well known in the automotive industry, being advising to government and the industry for, for many years. Um, so maybe Justin, yeah, maybe ask this. For the, I mean, the first question to you is, I mean, I mean, how significant is the automotive industry to South Africa in terms of investment and employment? Maybe just give us um, your perspective of, yeah, I mean, why is the automotive industry so important to South Africa? Thanks, Wayne. Uh... Good afternoon, listeners. Um, yeah, the I mean, the auto industry employs around 115,000 people uh, in terms of the manufacturing portion of the value chain. So around 30,000 in assembly and then the balance in the auto components industry. There's obviously a lot more employed in the dealerships and in the uh, services sector, but those are what I would call um, non-tradables. So those are pretty much aligned with how the market performs. Whereas of course, the manufacturing portion of the value chain um, is uh, a tradable. It uh, substitutes for imports and it generates exports. So it's an important employer. Um, the numbers don't always tell the importance of the industry. Uh, this is an industry that's got high wages and high salaries uh, by manufacturing standards. So it punches well above its weight when we look at the gross value added, for example, in the sector. So uh, the manufacturing portion of the value chain is around about 3% of GDP. Um, another 3% would be in the services sector. Uh, that would make it the second biggest manufacturing sector in the country. Food and beer would be bigger. Uh, but it's roughly about a quarter of our of our manufacturing um, sector. Um, it's also a standout performer. This is a sector that's done well. Um, it's coming for ongoing criticism around levels of subsidization, which are misplaced because um, the subsidization occurs through a rebate mechanism as opposed to uh, direct subsidy support. Only about two billion of the actual um, incentives for the industry are cash-based. The rest are all uh, rebate-based. Um, so it's a sector that contributes substantially to the economy, uh, large amounts of sunk capital, um, positive impact on our trade uh, balance at the moment, has been for a few years now. Um, some serious headwinds limiting its growth potential. So it's been stuck pretty much where it's at for about 10 years now in terms of its employment, in terms of its contribution to, to GDP, but um, still a formidable base and, and by far the most advanced base on the African continent. Um, there'll be talk about Morocco uh, because Morocco is producing similar numbers of vehicles to us, slightly less, but not far off anymore, but they're making a much, much cheaper set of vehicles than what we are. So if you look at GVA, uh, gross value added, we are still more than double the size of the Moroccan automotive industry. So we're still the largest um, automotive manufacturing industry on the continent by, by some margin. Thanks, Justin. Um, and, and I suppose, I mean, that's really setting the scene um, between obviously South Africa and Morocco. So there's a reasonably sized manufacturing base um, I mean, Af in Africa. I mean, Paul, I mean, that's obviously, like, I suppose, looking at the past. I mean, I mean, how do you see the future in terms of like a, a five-year uh, forecast for manufacturing? And I mean, what do you think the, the, the opportunities are for um, for localization um, in the auto value chain? Yeah, thanks, and uh, thanks, Dwayne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, so I think we we have to look a little bit in the past, Dwayne, um, and we and we have to start, I suppose, with the auto industry master plan. Which, which really had uh, 2015 as its base uh, with, with about 600,000 vehicles produced in South Africa. And that had quite a nice growth trajectory of around uh, 760,000 in 2020, uh, 900,000 in 2025, and over uh, 1.1 million in 2030. So very nice trajectory. The reality, however, is that, um, as Justin said, is that Although there were close to 600,000 vehicles in 2015, 
2019 uh, was a peak year of around 615,000 vehicles. So not the, the tra trajectory that was expected. And then there was COVID. And, and so, and then following COVID were the floods in, in KZN. So, so the industry went down to around uh, 420,000 vehicles in 2020. So a significant decrease. Uh, and it's really struggled, I suppose, to grow after that. So, so 500,000 in, in 2021. And, and last year was the highest since 2019 of, of around 650,000 vehicles. If you look at for this year uh, and you read uh, NAMSA's uh, uh, comparative analysis month on month uh, through to June, you will see that on a comparative basis, uh, we are down again in, in 2024. So if you extrapolate that forward, probably around 610,000 uh, vehicles this year. So, so five years is, is very difficult uh, to determine uh, and, and with the challenges that, that all the OEMs are going through, the challenges uh, in the economies around the world. But, uh, you know, as Justin said, the auto component industry is, is significant behind this. So, so every, you know, I, I talk on behalf of Meta, but, uh, but I'm sure I talk on behalf of, of all of them. You know, the looking for those localization opportunities, you know, e even though the, the, the base of vehicles is not what we thought, you know, what are the further localization opportunities uh, we, we can look at? New players coming into the South African market, you know, Stellantis being one. What are the opportunities uh, for us as localization? And, you know, Beth will talk to it, but Narcan plays plays a fundamental job uh, in helping us identify those opportunities. So, so you know, n not a great year last year. Well, last year was was better than uh, the year before, uh, but you know, 2019 was already six fifteen thousand vehicles, and maybe we'll be at that for this year. But it's it's really uh, you know solidifying each of the companies, making sure you know their their, their tactics and their strategies are there, and and kind of riding through the storm. I see that uh, over the next few years, Dwayne. Thanks, Paul. I mean, yeah, Beth, that probably leads us into, I mean, the auto industry around the world um, gets lots of support, right? Um, there obviously is an argument saying it's a heard the word like a you know, special class industry because it crowds in other investments um, in other industries as well. And if you can make cars, you can maybe make anything. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, what do you think the key policy and infrastructure initiatives are needed for South Africa to you know, make sure that we you know, stabilize the industry and grow it? Um, I mean, how do you see that from a Narcan perspective? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, Ren. I think... Justin and Paul have set a really good kind of picture or scene for, for this particular question. So I think Justin's clearly highlighted the importance of the sector and the fact that it does punch above its weight. And Paul has really touched on what I think is NARCAM our priority is, which is localization. Where we sit, I think, and Justin made mention of the support that the sector already garners, as a NARCAM position, we want stability there. And I think that's important from an investor confidence perspective. We have a good APDP program. It is supportive of the sector. That needs to remain in place and remain stable purely to, as I say, encourage uh, continuous investment into the sector. That being said, I think localization really is the one area where if we were to go into tweaks with APDP from a policy perspective, uh, localization is probably the area that needs to be considered. We are falling behind the master plan targets quite significantly. Uh, I think about 39.5% local content uh, in 2023 versus what we should have been on the trajectory perspective of about 46%. Um, so where we're sitting, we think there needs to be a degree of tweaking within the policies to further incentivize and encourage localization. And, and that really will help the sector grow. It creates a more value add from a component perspective. And uh, with that, obviously more jobs uh, and more skilled jobs at that. So that's really it on the policy side uh, and where our kind of key focus sits. On an infrastructure perspective, obviously to localize, we need to be as globally competitive as possible. Uh, we already do have world-class manufacturers within the, the sector, but certainly more competitiveness enhancing reforms. Uh, so if we're talking about port efficiency, obviously stopping load shedding, those type of infrastructure reforms would certainly help really promote South Africa as an investment destination of choice and encourage the growth in production and localization. Uh, and then beyond the kind of more obvious uh, infrastructure reforms and obviously localization as a policy uh, intervention, we also need to consider, well, where do opportunities lie? Uh, from where we sit, I think you mentioned at the start the, the African market and how that's growing quite rapidly. We see export growth as a really key strategy to somewhat de-risk the South African industry from 
a low growth environment that South Africa as a country is in uh, and really capitalize on opportunities. And I think if we're talking purely Africa, look, there's, there's export opportunities outside of just Africa. But if we're talking Africa, uh, where our focus as NARCAM is sitting is the moment seeing how we can develop particularly the aftermarket side of, of exports into the continent. I think that's where the opportunity currently sits. Uh, but equally looking uh, longer term to develop uh, a wider kind of export basket, uh, not just into Africa, but uh, the wider kind of trading uh, ecosystem. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Um, and I, mean, I suppose that leads us uh, back to you, Justin, around there's lots of talk about uh, new energy vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, um, mm -hmm. and how that's creating yeah, potential risk. Okay, um, I mean, currently most manufacturers in South Africa I've got a whole, I suppose, value chain that's supporting internal combustion engines. Um, so, I mean, I think the question really is, and then also we're starting to see nervousness globally, <laughs> let's maybe put it that way, um, where I think countries are sort of saying, okay, well, we initially had a, a target to ban ICE vehicles in 2030, and now they're, oh, maybe it's 2035, and you know, okay, and it's starting to get legislated. But there is, seems to be lots of nervousness around um, from government, okay, and maybe that might even change with the results of some of the elections that are happening <laughs> around the world. Um, I mean, what's your view in terms of the, um, um, I suppose, the NEVs? Is it is it really slowing? Okay, um, and how do you think that? Go back, go back to the discussion yeah. we're having with Beth around localization. Um, I mean, does it create an opportunity for us to localize, or is it putting some challenges? And headwinds for our local component and manufacturing industry. Maybe some of your insights. Um, yeah, I mean it's a broad question. I, I'll issue. I want to try and locate the question um, in regard to the local the local market. Um, so the challenge that we have in your Beth outlined the um, the strength of our policy framework, and you know the industry is obviously supported through the APDP and the umbrella sort of strategy is the South African Automotive Master Plan. Um, the challenge is that our, our automotive policy is actually schizophrenic. You know, everybody talks about the support the automotive industry gets, but the industry is actually excessively taxed in the market. So although we have a very supportive uh, production incentive, we actually have a very poorly constituted market. Um, this is a market that is excessively taxed. Uh, the ad valorem tax structure has not been adjusted since 1995. Um, essentially, even the cheapest motor cars in South Africa are now subject to, to quite severe luxury taxes, which were never meant for entry-level motor cars. You know, those taxes were set in uh, the mid-1990s for luxury cars, and, and they've never been, the, the level was never changed. So, you, know, you buy a family motor car in South Africa, you're already getting a 30% luxury tax. On top of that, the environmental levy and the and the tie levy, etc. So, um, we have a very, very highly taxed market, um, and the elasticity calculations we've done show how much damage that is doing to consumption in the market. So the challenge that we have in South Africa in relation to these new energy vehicles is amplified by our market structure and, and the way in which our market is taxed by National Treasury. So battery electric vehicles and any derivative of that. So if we talk about the hybrid, a soft hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, and then a battery electric, these vehicles are more expensive than the internal combustion equivalents. Um, the technology is not yet reached parity with the internal combustion engine, and it's still a few years off. It's getting close, but the, the, gap's, quite, uh, the gap's quite wide. Um, when we did the calculations a couple of years ago, when we did direct model comparisons with out subsidies. So without taking into account incentives, it was around about 50% more expensive on average, a battery electric over its US equivalent. Now, because we have a punitive tax structure where the, there's a gradient to the luxury tax in South Africa, any increase in price creates a higher tax burden. So in South Africa, a, um, a battery electric equivalent of an US is not going to be 50% more expensive. It's going to be 80% more expensive because of how this this luxury tax uh, gradient works in the country. So we're in a difficult position because of the schizophrenic policy. We, the government makes well over 80,000 rand a vehicle in terms of the amount of taxes it takes from every vehicle sold in the country. And yet there's a very generous support basis for the APDP. The APDP, however, requires a level of production um, 
in order to secure benefits. So there's a minimum scale up to plants, uh, which, uh, and then of course you earn these rebates. And these rebates are then used to import vehicles. So our production will always align with our market. So we have a major challenge in South Africa because at a certain point, our production reaches a level where all the vehicle assemblers can settle their duty accounts for their models they import into the domestic market. At that point, there is no longer an incentive to export vehicles from South Africa or to make any additional vehicles in the country. And so therefore, there's this dynamic relationship between production and domestic demand. Um, and that is why the master plan is highly compromised because the domestic market is performing so poorly. Now, I want to bring, bring this to the NEV issue. So the challenge we've had on the new energy vehicle side in South Africa is the government's fixated on trying to support new energy vehicles from a production perspective, but obviously doesn't want to support uh, market consumption because that is the sensitivity in relation to where the government grabs a whole lot of money from the industry, right? That's where the, the, the taxes sit. Mm -hmm. So the challenge that we have is that we've got an incredibly small battery electric vehicle market in the country, and there's no incentive to buying vehicles. Globally, we in a fractured environment. We've got developing economies like ours. You cannot afford to incentivize new energy vehicle consumption. And then, of course, we've got the developed economies um, who have, especially during COVID, pumped huge amounts of money into the transition of their vehicle fleets. But there's some challenges that are emerging. The one is they can't keep doing that, right? We are post-COVID, we are emerging from the crisis and um, the opportunity or rather the, the, the benefits of extending those uh, incentives are now no longer so obvious. Uh, and, and the key issue is that when those incentives are withdrawn, the market works the way it's supposed to do, which is it favors us over, uh, over battery electric vehicles because the, the vehicles are still a lot cheaper. Plus, there's a whole range of additional issues that we need to understand. BEV are much more expensive to insure. Um, we are still um, struggling to deal with end-of-life vehicle consequences for BEV product. It's early in their cycle, but we still don't know what to do with the batteries. There are a whole range of complexities that need to be worked out. This is not going to stop the BEV transition. The BEV transition is still going to come, but it may just push it out by five to eight years. So maybe a model cycle. So I think there's a little bit less enthusiasm because some of the market realities are starting to bite. Some of the life cycle cost considerations around the cost of insurance, et cetera, et cetera, on these vehicles and the cost of um, fixing them, et cetera, is, is becoming uh, noticeable. Those are global issues. We haven't even got there yet. Um, and I think we're going to really struggle on the transition to, to battery electric in South Africa specifically because of our peculiar market structure which needs to be corrected. So I agree with everything Bev said on the automotive APDP side, but we actually have a huge problem in South Africa in relation to how our market functions. And um, I've done a lot of policy work in South Africa, but one cannot get national treasury to shift on anything. And uh, that's since I started working in the early 2000s. And unless we do that, we've got a problem because our domestic market's got no further growth based on all the work we do. Justin, so it, I mean, fundamentally what you're saying, it's a, uh... It's a price point issue in the local market, right? So we do need, I suppose, a lot yeah. of pressure to be put on, I suppose, National Treasury, I think what you're saying is that, yeah, yeah we need some relief at uh, duty level to make the vehicles, I suppose, fundamentally yeah. more affordable. Um, so you can stimulate more demand, create more demand, and then you create more yeah. production. That's fundamentally what you're saying. So, don't say not on the CB, not on the import duty level, but specifically on the ad valorem tax structure level. So South Africa has this perverse situation where we have a 30% luxury tax, but the luxury tax kicks in and there's a valuation gets used, but it's about um, around about an 800,000 Rand vehicle before VAT is already receiving a 30% luxury tax uh, in South Africa, which is perverse. You've, you've already got about a 12% luxury tax on about a 200,000 vehicle, 220,000 vehicle. I mean, those vehicles should have no luxury tax on them. And then our 30% stays at 800. So if somebody purchases a 10 million rand super luxury car, the tax burden of 30% remains constant. So mm. what we've got is we've got an excessively taxed mid-market, and that mid-market is extremely price elastic. So what we're doing is we're forcing consumption down from the mid-market to the bottom end of the market where vehicles are slightly more affordable. And South Africa, as you can see it in the, in the profile of our consumption, 
South African vehicle consumption is in distress, not only in terms of sales, but the clear buying down from the mid-market to um, the entry point. And I wish National Treasury would do the maths, because when we did the maths a few years ago, we worked out that the, this is based on 2018 data, so before the COVID crisis, that the South African government was not tax optimized. When we measured the elasticities and we, and we measured the level of the tax, we calculated that the South African government was losing itself uh, billions of rands of, uh, of tax because of overtaxing vehicles, especially in those lower bands. And given the fact that they've done nothing uh, since then, I'm pretty confident that the situation's gotten a whole lot worse. Hmm. Oh, interesting discussion, Justin. So hopefully the National Treasury is listening to this and they can get more taxes if they tax less. <laughs> I mean, Paul, I mean, moving on to you, I mean, obviously you manufacture, you supply to OEMs. Um, I mean, I mean, how, how is how's Mete um, thinking about this NEV transition? Is it creating more opportunities, um, uh, bigger risks for you as a business? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, how's Mete looking at this um, this transition? Yeah. So, Dwayne. So, um, hopefully, a little bit more positively than than Justin <laughs> spells out. But um, you know, from a commercial perspective, um, you know, the OEMs. Uh, here in South Africa also have to have a compelling business case, right, uh, for, for their parent companies. And, and what is the compelling business case in South Africa? And a lot is also about, well, when you have localized companies uh, such as ourselves, are we competitive? Are we efficient? Are we better than Thailand or, or any of these other countries? And, and really, that's, that's where we focus on. So, so we have a lot of uh, R&D work that goes on um, uh, within, within each of our, our operations. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, you know, to Justin's point and your earlier point is probably a more focus on plug-in hybrid uh, from a South African perspective, from a manufacturing perspective, as opposed to the full uh, NEV. But if we, if we took our broad range of businesses and how we think about it, so, so we take our wire harnessing businesses uh, and, and we look at the number of circuits that would be involved in a, in a, in a plug-in hybrid or, a, or electric vehicle, how, how would we... Uh, accommodate that, you know, more copper content, uh, where, where's going to be the supply chain for that? So, so we look at it on that basis. From a lighting perspective in our lighting businesses, we look around the visibility around uh, the electric vehicle, the additional visibility that, that may be required, the aesthetics of that lighting. In our heat exchange products, it's a big change from combustion engine to, to electric vehicle or plug-in hybrids. So, so how do we position ourselves? Or, you know, what, what are our technical partners doing around that? In our plastic products, you know, the, the electric vehicles uh, are heavier. Um, and so you need to reduce weight to make it more efficient. So, so what, what more can be done in the molding and the, and the plastics businesses? And the same in our ride control businesses, in the suspension. You know, how do you have to adjust your suspensions and accommodate your suspensions for a potentially heavier vehicle or, or, or a different uh, dynamic around the vehicle? And then lastly, in the battery storage, um, obviously, what is the new technology uh, uh, of the battery storage that's going to be required? So, so we continually look at this, drain. We continually uh, use our technical partners uh, globally to help us look at this uh, and, and continually uh, make sure our people are, are going uh, globally and, and looking at, at the opportunities. And then over and above this, what are the other opportunities that we're not localizing and, and how could we adapt to those? So we, so we have a very commercial approach and, and try and keep on top of, uh, you know, latest uh, technology. Thanks, Paul. Um, I mean, Beth, bringing you in here, I mean, we've talked about the local manufacturing industry. Um, I mean, in sort of my opening remarks, I mean, our, our big markets for South Africa or Europe, um, Africa, and USA are the three biggest markets. Maybe there, there should be others, <laughs> but those, that's the current reality. Um, I mean, how, how do you see um, the, sort of the developments uh, in Europe? Um, I mean, should we be worried? Okay, um, is it, are our exports at risk? And are other things like um, I mean, we see out of the EU Green Deal now, uh, carbon border adjustment um, has been implemented. Yeah, it's not on motor vehicles yet, but it's on aluminium. And steel that goes into cars. So I mean, you just play this forward. Let's play this movie forward. I mean, at some point in the future, we can expect uh, motor vehicles and other components to be subject to this carbon border adjustment over the next couple of years. Um, 
I mean, how do you think that's going to be impacting the uh, South African export industry? Is it, is it a risk or an opportunity for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's, well, let's maybe first start with the, the CBAM kind of element of your question. So as you say, not currently on vehicles, but I don't, I don't think anyone would be sitting here thinking that Europe isn't going to extend CBAM in the coming years to, to be placed on a lot more products. And even beyond CBAM, I mean, if you read into the Green Deal, uh, they've already suggested that I think by next year they'll be implementing or, or uh, publishing a way in which supply chain uh, emissions in the automotive supply chain specifically can be monitored and checked. Uh, what's the point of monitoring and checking things if you're not going to ultimately look to regulate them? So uh, I think it's uh, logical to to really extrapolate and say it's going to impact the sector. Um, there's a couple of ways to look at it from an export perspective, and I think we'd be foolish not to consider both elements and act on both elements. The one part is to say our export basket is exceptionally concentrated, both in terms of product and market. As you say, from a market perspective, over 40% of our exports are going to Europe, add on a bit more to, to Africa, and that's a bit easier, I suppose, as an export opportunity, less regulations. But uh, certainly Europe and then the US, as you say, we know that they're increasingly stringent on particularly environmental regulations, and that poses a degree of risk. Equally, on the component side of things, catalytic converters are uh, over 40% of our export basket from a component side. And we know within a wider NEV transition conversation, specifically with battery electric vehicles, there's a declining demand for catalytic converters. So effectively, what we're sitting with is a heavily concentrated export basket that has a lot of risks to it, both in terms of markets and components supplied. So what is the attitude we, or I, I think we need to be taking on one part, preserve what we do have. You know, it's not going to be an overnight transition from, from ice to BEV uh, in the next year. There is still opportunity in the ice world. And so how do we really uh, capture that opportunity? Can we pull in the last of the Capcom uh, production? It would make sense given that we have PGMs uh, locally available. And so there's strategies to look at how do we preserve the ice production we have. From a European market perspective, it's certainly starting to get suppliers ready to lower their carbon emissions, remain up to date with what the regulations are requiring with the, uh, of them, so that when the time comes that we remain competitive in a European market. So that's the kind of protective element to, to try and mitigate the risks. The other side of it, and I, I mentioned it in my opening remarks, is, well, where do the opportunities sit? And I think, uh, positively, I was reading uh, Minister Tao's uh, budget vote speech that I think came out a day or two ago, and there, and equally Deputy Minister Whitfield, and there they've really stressed the importance of exports and growing export markets. And I think working with the government and, and private sector, there's a lot of scope for us to look into well, what components could become, I don't want to say the next CatCons, but could become a really big export opportunity for us. Where do we have competitive advantages and how do we promote that? And equally looking and, and doing a full assessment of existing trade relations, the countries where we maybe need to get better trade relations to really expand the markets we export to. So we're almost tackling it from two directions, which is preserve what we have, but equally grow what we currently don't have to try and find ourselves not just in a position where we, we sit maybe in 10 years time with the same export basket and we've managed to maintain it at what is it currently around 70 billion rands worth of component exports uh, exports per annum like how do we grow that even further uh, and as i said at the beginning of my uh, my chat with you earlier uh, you know exports really is a way to to de-risk our own uh, domestic industry and so i think that's the approach we need to take do i have the answers now exactly which components and which mass uh, markets absolutely not uh, but that's certainly the work uh, both narcan and i'm sure dtic and other stakeholders will be doing over the next uh, couple of months and years. Thanks, Beth. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, it, there is a really good opportunity to obviously de-risk our exports. I mean, it is quite concentrated, as you say. Um, I mean, as I think, you know, I said in my opening remarks, I mean, Africa is our second biggest market. Um, but the question is, could it be much bigger? I mean, we know um, um, the AAAM is putting a lot of effort into Africa um, and creating an Africa auto strategy, um, um, hub and spoke model, um, and looking at and also doing research around what are the real opportunities for OEMs, but also for component manufacturers across Africa. Um, so maybe Justin, maybe bringing you back into the discussion around, I mean, what do you see the opportunities uh, for South African manufacturers in Africa? Is there a real opportunity for us to grow what we're currently doing? Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe some, yeah, some of your insights and comments on in, you know, in what sectors and which part is there a big opportunity in the ice value chain? Because I mean, even though yeah. there might be bans in Europe, 
Um, I, I haven't really seen too many notifications from African governments around banning ICE vehicles in uh, in Africa. So maybe some of your comments there. So, so Dwayne, I, I think you know once again building off of uh, Beth's uh, views, I, I, I completely agree. I think we're quite vulnerable because of our exposure to Europe. I mean, when I did the maths a couple of years ago, eighty-two percent of the value generated in the South African auto assembly industry is generated from exports because we export much more valuable vehicles than what we supply locally. So we're vulnerable. And 70% um, of those exports go into the broader European market area. So if we include uh, the EU, the European free trade area, as well as the United Kingdom, mm. all of which are shifting. They've either got very tight, uh, but they've already got tight controls. They've all announced I think prematurely bans on the internal combustion engine. And of course, the CBAM by 2030 is supposed to include all imports into the EU. So although it's steel and, and aluminium now, vehicles will be included very shortly. So we know there are going to be consequences and we have vulnerabilities. So the natural market for us is Africa. But here's the big challenge. Africa doesn't need South Africa. Uh, Africa needs to develop regional value chains. And so the challenge for us as South Africans is if we want to be major players in and be supportive of the development of a true African automotive industry, we have to operate in Africa very differently from um, the established importers into those markets. So Africa is a huge market, potentially. The problem is the importation of pre-owned vehicles. There's a large amount of uh, dumping of product in, in African markets. Um, so at the moment, I'm actually the advisor to the Cote d'Ivoire government on their automotive policy and the advisor to the Benin government on their policy. So I've been doing a lot of work in West Africa over the last couple of years. And all I see is opportunity. But mm -hmm. I often think as South Africans, we ask the wrong question because they don't need our product. They need to develop their own industrial capabilities. So the question is, and this is why I really support the work of the AAAM, is how do we create regional value chains? How do we realize the potential of this 5 million vehicle market? Because it doesn't have to be created, it's there. We need to displace the importing of the secondhand and gray goods, because there's a huge amount of dumping of new vehicles, but that are not officially uh, exported through the, uh, through the, through the OEMs, hmm. and, and principally done through the Middle East. And if we could shift that, then we have the potential. So take a country like Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire, until 2017, permitted old vehicles on its roads and sold hardly any new vehicles. They introduced a five-year limit on passenger vehicles. That passenger vehicle market is now 28,000 units. It's the largest in West, uh, in West Africa by some margin. They've got about another 12,000 units that are being displaced by pre-owned vehicle imports that are coming in. So the ones that are less than five years. So they're up to a market of about 40, of around 40,000 units. Um, if we start repeating that across many economies, um, then we're in a position to see the sort of the, the this major growth potential. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, they will ban the importing of second-hand motor cars by 2035 completely. Um, and then they'll probably have a market of around 55, 60,000 units. Still small, but when you start looking at Ghana and uh, Senegal, and if Nigeria ever uh, uh, puts together a reasonable policy, um, it will obviously then grow very, very rapidly as well. So there's a huge market potential. The challenge is, and this is the tension that we have in South Africa, is we want to sell product into these African economies. And I, I just don't see it. Uh, we need to build industrial capability with these economies. We have to find reciprocal trade opportunities with these economies so that we can jointly develop this massive potential that exists in Africa. Otherwise, the African countries are going to find other partners to work with, and we'll miss the boat. And just I mean, it's some interesting numbers you quoted there, right? Sort of 5 million, I suppose, yeah. car market. Obviously, a lot of those are currently secondhand vehicles coming from was mostly the East, I would guess. Um, I mean, it is, I suppose, reassuring that the governments are starting to understand to create a market, you must stop in, uh, allowing the imports of the vehicles. So you're saying that the potential automotive market in Africa can be five times bigger? Okay, from like Easy. a million, 
um, from a million vehicles produced to five million. I mean, yeah. That sounds like a really yeah. big opportunity. Um, and I get your point. Um, it can't just be South Africa just exporting. Um, so I think the challenge you, what I'm saying, you putting down to the auto value chain is that how do they go and partner with those other African countries to create a value chain, a regional value yeah. chain that there's you know, benefits to both as opposed to just you just seeing them as another market. Would that would that be would that be a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the key issue is these economies need to structurally transform. So, you know, in, in our position, we've got a very uh, sizable base. So, so I'll give you an example. Um, South Africa has 10 million adults that can afford a motor car. We've had 10, 10 million adults who could afford a motor car for a decade. And all of the projections going forward, uh, for as long as uh, the modeling that we've done can be projected for it, is we'll still have 10 million adults who can afford a motor car. South Africa does not have a growing middle class. We have a completely static middle class. We've reached peak vehicle consumption based on our based on the data that I have. A country like Cote d'Ivoire, for example, only has 1 million adults that can afford a motor car. But by 2035, they will have 3 million adults mm -hmm. and when they can afford a car. And, and you know, these other small economies like Bedina that are starting with a much smaller base, but they're all going through the same transformation. And it's the accumulation of, of that purchasing power that ultimately gives uh, the African automotive market space a real gravity. The question for, for us is how do we position South Africa to play a leading role as that gravity um, as that gravity develops. Because there's there's a belief in South Africa that we're sort of the, the entry point into Africa, and I just don't buy it. Uh, we're on the one extremity, and there are many other opportunities. We have to be very conscious, and we have to be very um, strategic in how we work with, collaborate with, in order to create these uh, these opportunities. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, Justin, I think the, I mean, the AAAM, I think, is doing a lot of good work to create, what's the right word, bridges um, yeah. and opportunities for collaboration, also doing a lot of research to work out what are those opportunities in these countries um, for localization. I think it fundamentally comes about to, uh, to create a proper auto industry. You need local, you need policy, okay, like we talked about earlier. Um, so you need strong automotive policy to create the foundation um and then you obviously need to create a, uh, create a market um so i mean i mean come, coming to you paul i mean you, you've got a, a a strong automotive um value chain you manufacture various different products um you know in the meta group um you can see wiring wiring harnesses i think is really is a, is a good example um i mean I mean, what do you think the opportunities, I mean, based on what Justin is saying, I mean, what do you think the opportunities in the Metair group will be apart from, I suppose, what you've already uh, spoken to us about? Yeah, no, so, so you know, I 100% agree with what Justin has said. Um, but it's a pity because, you, you know, this discussion needs the OEMs involved uh, as well, uh, because we, we just the component supply. Um, and, and if you look at the history of, of the South African market and, and where it sits today and, and maybe the Moroccan in the north, you know, the two major producers on the African continent of, of motor vehicles, it's hard, to, hard does South Africa, 100% to what Justin said, work together with African, other African countries to encourage OEMs in setting up manufacturing facilities in those countries? How, how can Africa become really competitive uh, in having other manufacturing hotspots. And, and once you have that, you can then create what we are, which is a tier one, which is a, a auto component manufacturer for those OEMs. You know, the aftermarket, uh, the other point that Justin has said, that, that, that's a different ball game. You know, the, the, you know uh, that's uh, challenges against all sorts of gray goods and other goods. And, uh, you know, that, that is the rest of Africa. It's just about aftermarket parts uh, flooded in from, from anywhere else. So, so the structural approach that Justin has said is uh, got to be the vision of, of where Africa as a continent becomes the, the OEM uh, choice destination, no matter which part it is in, there's got to be a lot of sharing. And we can help uh, as South Africans share that technology 
encourage the technical partners that we have and build those other um, um, industries or build the OEM industry in those other African countries. That, that's got to be the next step. Otherwise, we're just sitting here to Justin's point. I gave you the figures of the vehicles. Where is it all going? Is it going to grow? Is it just going to be stagnant? Will we ever hit the 1.3 million uh, vehicles uh, in South Africa as per the auto industry plan? Um, and, and so, you know, all of the auto component manufacturers that are here, not just Mete, um, are very good at what they do because they help keep the OEMs competitive. And so they're all very good. Um, but but it's it's not enough to sit at 600,000 vehicles for the next 10 years because, you know, that, that that's a very sorry picture uh, from a South African perspective. Mm. So, so, I mean, Paul, I mean, you make an important point. Is, I mean, the OEMs are a big part of the solution to this conversation. Um, and I mean, I mean, talking about the market opportunity for cars in in Africa, right? Yeah, and yeah. obviously, secondhand cars mm -hmm. um, nearly destroys that market, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so as we're going on a journey to, yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, put up, a, I suppose, a trade barrier. Um, to make sure there's no imports of um, um, secondhand cars. I mean, we've seen that in South Africa, how effective that is, right? I mean, you, if you allowed secondhand cars to be imported in South Africa um, with our challenges around duties and price points, I mean, yeah, it would have a significant impact on, on OEMs. Um, I mean, I suppose the question is always about how can us as a collective, I mean, component manufacturers, OEMs, um, you know, work closer together to create those regional value chains that Justin's uh, are, are talking about. Um, we've got the triple AM. I mean, is there, is there more that needs to be done? No, I think the, the triple AM is, is a very good starting point, Dwayne, but, but you also then need um, uh, government alignment across Africa, like in many, many other industries. So, so that alignment... Uh, uh, from a you know free trade, uh, from a, a collective, you know, I, I always you know, and I'm new to the industry, so so, but um, I, I really love these South African uh, industries that can walk with pride um, and 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 really help uh, the African continent uh, expand. But you know, you you have to sit back and say, why can't Africa and many of these other countries be what Thailand does for the OEMs? Yeah. Why, why, why does it have to be Thailand? And, and that's the mentality we have to adopt. Otherwise, we will just sit here and, and, and you know, just, just struggle along. So AAA is very good. It's, it's, it's a great initiative, NOCAM, NAMSA, but you have to have governmental alignment across Africa uh, through, through trade agreements, et cetera. And Paul, you also uh, see over, it's a global organization. It's not just a South African organization. Um, I mean, I mean, are there any lessons? I mean, you, you say you're sitting in Turkey currently. <laughs> um, I mean, so, and, and I mean, are there any lessons I mean, so, um, from those operations that we can bring back to South Africa to, yeah, I mean, accelerate some of this um, transition? Um, or yeah, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's very it's very competitive, uh, mm -hmm. Brian. Um, the the advantage, um, so, so we have battery plants, uh, as you know, in Turkey and Romania, um, who have relationships with OEMs and have relationships with the aftermarkets. So, so, so I wouldn't say there's, there's a learning. I, I think the key for us as auto component manufacturers, and, and that's just the way the industry has been created, is those technical partners that we use mm -hmm. uh, are key. And, and getting those technical partners who have the IP and, and have the, the knowledge as part of the solution uh, in helping build the African story, I think that 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 could be an avenue, perhaps that that we have not explored properly. Yeah. I mean, you make an interesting point. I mean, I mean, with all the I suppose NEV vehicles and all the technology going into vehicles these days, right? I mean, there's new brands popping up all the time um, in the auto value chain, and a lot of those are in the technology space. Um, we all talk about e-mobility these days. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of different business plans, business cases, but there's lots of different, um, maybe more technical partners. I think your point is that maybe we need to be crowding into the um, um, South African and African uh, in, in, into the landscape. Um, also, 
I mean, I've been working um, on with lots of automotive companies and also lots of technology companies. And South Africa has got some real strength in technology. I mean, you just go down to the Cape and Stellenbosch and see all those technology hubs there, and even some of that in the in the auto sector. Um, and yeah, maybe there's something there that we maybe need to. There's a gem that maybe we need to incubate even further um, to create more opportunities um, across the auto value chain. Because I think technology uh, is a big part of the solution. Agree. And and again, it, it can't be Meta alone. It, mm. it, it's got to involve OEMs. It's got to involve uh, the rest of the auto component manufacturers. Um, you know, it, it's it's got to be a joint effort. Yes, we're all about uh, commercial return. Uh, but if you want to grow, uh, you you know you have to have a growth mindset that says you do it as a collective. No, yeah, thanks, Paul. So Beth, I mean, I mean, just thinking about this NEV ice, it's a balance, right? Okay. Um, yeah. And I was looking at some of the numbers that were coming out of um, Egypt around setting targets around. Um, NEV versus ICE balance. And I think they were setting targets to, I think about 17% best case to be EVs by 2050. That's a long way away. <laughs> um, but I'll look at another way. So that's 17% EVs, but that's 83%. That's ICE, still going to be ICE vehicles in many African markets. And I assume many other markets around the world as well, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean how, how should the industry be thinking about that Balance and also as well, even if you're not making um, ice vehicle, I mean, yeah, ice vehicles anymore. I mean, there might still be a lots on the road that need parts, right? So you've got lots of members who are going to still have to carry on making parts for those vehicles for for many many years to come. So maybe just some of your insights in that balance. You're going to hit the nail on the head when you use the word balance. There, I think. Uh, from a strategy perspective, it would be silly for us to to put all the eggs in the, the EV basket right now and forget about the opportunities that align with ICE. But likewise, I think we'd be silly to just think, you know, ICE is the future forevermore and not be looking at, at what the opportunities under an EV uh, ecosystem would be. I think from a South African perspective, you highlighted already the kind of guys who'd be supplying aftermarket parts for the ICE vehicles that will still be on the road long past you know, the initial phase out of, of the sale of new new ICE vehicles. So they certainly have a, a place and, and they still need to be operating. And so it's how do we keep them competitive in a South African environment? Equally, I think, and we often as NARCAM get the question of, you know, can the component supplier base respond to an EV transition? What is the kind of positioning of, of our component sector? And I think the first thing to also recognize here is a lot of what we do, minus the export basket, which is a bit more technology specific, a lot of what we are producing here is technology neutral. I, I always use the kind of layman example of a seat is a seat is a seat. Yes, there's odd uh, changes within an EV, weight changes, et cetera, but a seat will still have application in an electric vehicle. And so a lot of what we are producing will work in an ICE vehicle or work in an electric vehicle, and that at least mitigates some, mitigate some risk of overnight or, or even over a period of time, everything that we're producing in South Africa will become uh, obsolete, shall we call it. Uh, I also think if we look more on the kind of South African trajectory of what we're producing here, you, I don't think we're going to find a case where suddenly our domestic OEMs are going from ICE to solely producing even hybrids or, or battery electric vehicles. What you're seeing most of them doing is having a facility that has an ICE variant, a hybrid variant, and, and maybe in the future a battery variant. And so that equally provides a bit more of a I guess, scope for any of our component suppliers that are producing technology-specific components, such as your catalytic converters. And then looking more specifically at a point in time where investments are needed for, for more battery electric vehicles, uh, Paul's clearly highlighted it. Companies aren't just sitting around and waiting for it to happen. They're actively researching. They're actively identifying where opportunities sit. And a lot of our sector is in a good position in the sense of, a, a lot of them are multinationals. I think probably about 60 to 70 percent of our tier ones in the country are multinationals. So even if they in the South African subsidiary don't have the technology, the sister companies somewhere in the world generally do. And so the question becomes, how do we make South Africa as competitive and as attractive as possible to onshore those type of technologies? And then even where, I mean, companies don't necessarily or aren't part of a multinational group, uh, someone like a Meta, that yes, okay, they do have some companies abroad, but equally, uh, Paul highlighted, I mean, they have technology partnerships, and that's not uh, unique just to a Meta. There's plenty of other local companies that similarly do have those type of, of international partnerships. 
So I think in trying to kind of weigh up that ICE versus EV debate, maybe, I don't think it's a cop out. I think we have to somewhat sit in the middle and say, how do we position ourselves to still support ICE and not forget that that still is an opportunity that still has, you know, that still has a lot of fruit to bear for a lot of our component manufacturers, but also how do we position ourselves in an EV, EV space? And I think, look, the EV, I think Justin mentioned it, we're possibly looking at a longer time frame for that transition, but nevertheless, it's happening. I think if we look at policy amendments that have happened over the last uh, little while, and in fact, at the moment, I know uh, APDP is currently in its amendment phase to incorporate EVs. There is some support there. There's uh, increased AIS to support uh, technology investments into, into electric vehicle components. Um, so it's, it's kind of an open playing field at the moment in the sense of we need to explore all avenues. We can't close ourselves off to, to any which uh, technology grouping. But I think the underlying message, so to speak, or, or important element underneath all of these opportunities is what is putting South Africa in a competitive position? How do we bolster overall sector competitiveness? If we do that, we can respond to any opportunity that comes our way, as long as we're competitive. And, and that needs to be addressed in certain elements to ensure that we can remain uh, part of a global value chain. Mm, thanks, Beth. I, mean, I see there's a, moving on to some of the questions, I see Mark's posed a question here around, also, we've got ICE vehicles and we've got EV vehicles, okay? Um, but there obviously is a, um, there's some concessions, or well, maybe concessions, um, around allowing what they call e-fuel vehicles after 2035. So I suppose no combustion uh, vehicles, zero combustion vehicles, but still using an ICE engine, right? Um, I mean, I think that also creates opportunities. So maybe, I mean, Justin, I mean, what's, maybe what's your perspective on how that creates opportunities for South Africa to extend maybe the life of, I suppose, the ICE value chain in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Your comments on that? Yeah, I'm going to answer this in relation to the, the African question. Because, I mean, better outline the, the, the challenges for us. I mean, so the thing that strikes me from working in different places around Africa is the distinction between the um, big concentrated wealthy cities and um, the much poorer hinterland. So in these emerging uh, sort of urban agglomerations, places like Cotonou, Abidjan, Dakar, Lagos, uh, Lome, these places are going to encourage small cars. So, so one can almost imagine an NEV transition in those spaces. Same in South Africa, the Santons, the Cape Town CBD, et cetera. But the moment you start leaving those centers, you start going into very, very basic infrastructure where essentially you need a ladder chassis based product. A monocoque won't cut it, not even a, 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 a more expensive monocoque. So, so you're into ladder chassis. And of course, ladder chassis now has a weight wind coefficient uh, element that, that makes it far less attractive as a BEV uh, product. So I do think it's not an either or. I think there's going to be in an African environment, there's going to be a lot more complexity around, around this transition. Added to that is the uh, critical importance and the need to develop uh, commercial vehicle fleets. So um, it's the movement of goods as populations become wealthier and there's more consumption. But there's also the movement of people in terms of um, of um, of uh, either minibuses, minibuses, bigger buses, et cetera, commuter buses. So there's going to be a reconfiguration because the key is to get people off motorcycles and into, into much safer transport modes. So I think we're going to see this, we're going to see this blend. Um, and, and, and it's in that blend that I don't think the technological answers are there yet. So you can get a hydrogen ice, you know, and I think hydrogen ice, you know, there's there's, there's strong proponents for hydrogen ice. There's synthetic, um, not synthetic, there's biofuels in in um, as, as options for us that would render them uh, a lot more environmentally uh, sort of sustainable. So I think there's going to be a range of differential uh, greener technologies that would apply. It, 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 it's all a bit ironic when you know I go to some of these big ports in in different uh, African contexts, and you know the trucks on average, and I'm not exaggerating. I would uh, I'd put a whole lot of money down that the average age of the trucks is 40 years. If one was to just 
uh, modernize that fleet to an average of 10 years, you'd get rid of over half of the carbon that's being emitted by those incredibly old, inefficient uh, trucks. So there is a lot of stuff that gets spoken about um, with, without really understanding context in, in relation to these countries. And I think the modernization of their ice fleets would be uh, of huge cost of huge um, positive consequence for uh, the greening of the transport sector in uh, in Africa. So I think ICE has got a big component still. Cool. Thanks for that. Maybe Beth, I'm going to be changing a little bit of tack here. I mean, obviously, as a component manufacturing association, I mean, there must be lots of pressure to create more localization opportunities and crowding um, the um, smaller business sector. Okay. Um, so the question here is, I mean, how can smaller businesses get part of, be part of this auto value chain? Um, are there specific opportunities that need to be looked at? Um, are there specific opportunities that need to be manufacturing other products and can tilt to auto? Maybe just some of your insights around, yeah, is there an opportunity to crowd in yeah, other um, yeah, smaller, smaller manufacturers into the auto value chain? Sure. So I think maybe just starting at the first point, which is, I mean, just crowding anyone into the automotive sector, I think uh, Paul would certainly agree on this one, is that we need to be increasing volumes uh, to create scale economies and to make the business case more viable to be in the value chain. From a smaller kind of enterprise perspective, and that's something that is not, can we spend a lot of our time looking at, and particularly a kind of transformed tier two, tier three base. And I say specifically tier two, tier three, I think that's really where at an early stage with someone coming into the sector, that's probably the easiest entry point purely from the, the basis of, or A, the quality requirements are, are slightly less than if you're supplying as a tier one directly into your OEMs. So you can get away with, a, say, an ISO 9001 at a tier two, tier three level. Uh, when you're supplying into OEMs very often, you're needing uh, IATF 6949 and, and more kind of technical uh, uh, technical uh, specifications there. And equally, a lot of the tier one value chain is dominated by global purchase arrangements with multinationals. So I think from a SME perspective coming in at that tier two, tier three base is the easiest. Uh, and there's never anything easy in getting into the autos value chain, but that's certainly easier than a tier one uh, sort of area. That being said, you made a mention of, you know, should they be doing something else and then coming in? I think our lessons in, in NARCAM at least is that very often getting people in from what we term the allied sector. So if you're thinking aviation, maritime, rail, et cetera crowding those guys who already have an existing business in those sectors where often lower volume, uh, less demand certainty, but better margins, having them come into the autos value chain makes a bit more sense than having pure startups. I mean, startups certainly can work in some cases, but I think having an existing business that equally has the support of other sectors um, has additional capacity on that end, can then come into automotive and probably find that transition slightly easier. They've got the existing business to support that kind of entry process into the automotive value chain. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's really where we see the opportunity is particularly allied sector companies entering tier two, tier three level. Uh, and certainly I think there's a lot more though to be done to make that kind of entry easier. Uh, if you ask me where I also see opportunity, I think the, the automotive uh, investment transformation fund, yeah. uh, AITF is an interesting kind of dynamic to this conversation because for the first time you're really mandating particularly OEMs but uh, component manufacturers are also joining now mandating them to be incorporating additional often smaller scale black owned industrialists into the value chain uh, and along with the, the kind of financing solution that AITF offers there's also a guaranteed market access that comes with it so I think hopefully over the next few years we'll see a lot more entrants entering at that kind of level and AITF is certainly something to watch in terms of almost forcing that outcome. Thanks, Beth. I mean, Paul, have you got anything to add from a meta perspective in creating and getting smaller companies into the value chain um, mm -hmm. and you know, leveraging off the AIT? It's exactly what, what Beth says. Uh, the, the starting point is the volumes, right? Um, the Using the AITF in, in trying to identify new component parts, you know, um, traditionally, you know, we've got significant investments in, ma in a very large manufacturing facilities um, and that, that's that, you know, not everybody can do that, right? So, so how do you get uh, perhaps tier two, tier three, maybe more down the technology slant that uh, Beth talks about? So, so, so we're fully aware of it, uh, Dwayne. Uh, you know, this this is a this is a 
a really good South African story and, and, yeah. and a South African story that needs to be more inclusive of all the opportunities to make us all efficient um, and, and add value, you know, to, to South Africa. So, so there are opportunities for sure. Yeah. And maybe sort of leading into one of the other questions I see around the, there's a lot of drive in some of the developed markets around recycling. Okay. Um, you know, is that something that Mete um, is looking at around, okay, so how do you get recycled, using more recycled material in the products you manufacture? And is that maybe an opportunity yeah. um, for these SMEs? So, so there's, there's two areas uh, where we actually do recycle. The one would be in our, in our battery manufacturer. So, so recycling all lead acid batteries uh, from, from both the lead that you recover, but also from the, the plastic. Uh, and, and using that recycling, uh, because it's, it's far easier to recycle uh, a battery and, and remanufacture rather than buy virgin lead. So that's definitely an opportunity. And then obviously in our, in our molding businesses as well, right? Um, uh, using as much recycled material as possible, you know, provided you can you conform to the spec. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I mean, the whole circular economy uh, and where it's going, that's something we are looking at. You know, how, how do we view the circular economy? Um, how can we get better at the circular economy? So, yeah, that's definitely something uh, for the future. Maybe, Justin, any, any, any of your comments on what you're seeing with the work you're doing in Africa around the circular economy and recycling? No, Dwayne, so, I mean, it's, an, it's obviously it's an emerging issue. I think one of the big challenges with regards to the automotive industry is how do you capture the value through the life cycle phase and then the disposal uh, phase mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the vehicle? Ironically, in an African context, it almost works against us. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of the vehicles that are sold in, um, in Africa are uh, pre-owned vehicles. I think the average age of a European vehicle dumped in Africa is, I think, 12 years, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. uh, old. That's on average. Um, I mean, I've been to parking lots in Benin supplying into the Nigerian market that sell up to 400,000 vehicles a year. And it's just literally kilometers of Toyota Highlanders and uh, these sort of mid-size SUVs from the United States selling between sort of fifty around fifteen thousand dollar mark uh, into these into these uh, markets, and it it's so patently the rich will dumping its product for uh, short life cycle use uh, and ultimately um, scrapping. So, matter of fact, I was even told that the, the import vehicles cut out the cats sell the cats and scrap the vehicle. It never ever goes onto the road in, in the West African market. They literally import the vehicle uh, to cut out the, the catalytic converter. So there's lots of opportunities, but we've got to sort out this sort of ritual dumping of its of its product in um, in developing markets. And uh, it's, uh, it's a huge problem in both East and West Africa. Oh, interesting comments. And I think, I mean, recycling, I think with a lot of the you know, EU Green Deal, um, you know, I suppose regulations coming coming into force now, um, yeah. I think it's, it's going to be a big issue to if you want to be accessing those markets. So maybe an interesting question here, I see um, in the steel industry, it's been a, a challenged industry uh, in South Africa. So maybe a question to you, Beth, here around I mean, how dependent is the sector on locally produced steel, I suppose the reverse of that is how much steel are we importing, and will the disrupt disruption of steel, uh, I suppose, supply, um, yeah, impact, um, I suppose, yeah, component manufacturers and or OEMs from making auto um, cars and components in South Africa? I mean, is that something that uh, Narcam has looked at? Yeah, so absolutely. I think, uh, and I'm just going to turn off my camera. I'm seeing a message here. My bandwidth is low. Apologies for that. Um, so I think from from an outcome end, absolutely, we've looked into this and a, a lot of the work we were doing at the start of the year um, while it was looking specifically at this. In terms of sector exposure, um, it's quite interesting. If you look at the split of OEMs, um, there's probably about three of those seven local OEMs, possibly four that are exceptionally exposed to to some of the, the challenges in the local steel market. 
Uh, the other OEMs are almost all uh, mandating that their steel is imported purely because uh, local steel does not meet their, their own uh, requirements or quality requirements, standard requirements, et cetera. So you're looking at probably half of the OEMs being exceptionally vulnerable to this. And obviously that then has supply chain implications. Um, from a NARCAM research perspective, I think we looked at about probably seven companies at immediate significant risk were uh, if AMSA were to close. Uh, and I think that's kind of the way we were positioning it as NARCAM is as much as the impact is very kind of OEM specific value chain linked, shall we call it, uh, the overall impact on sector competitiveness and the motivation for why we're producing in South Africa, when you don't have local availability of any steel, you know, questions begin to get asked. Um, and the kind of multiplier effect, can we call it, uh, is certainly large. And then there'll be questions on the general sector competitiveness. So, yeah, long story short, absolutely some value chains exceptionally exposed and exceptionally reliant on on those uh, steel or local steel availability and in fact even beyond our local oems i know some of our component manufacturers are, are not just you know competitive in a domestic environment they're exporting their components uh, all over the world i know us is a big market um, and their competitiveness rests purely on being able to access high quality local steel um, i think if you're asking me sort of longer term, what needs to happen there? I think AMS has come out and, and given some degree of indication that there'll be longer term production, which is certainly welcomed. But we need to look at how do we get more local grades of steel approved uh, and available. And I think that A, would solve some of the AMSA problems in terms of creating demand, but equally would certainly support wider sector localization. Uh, and so that's kind of, I think the initial NARCAM step was how do we avoid the initial crisis? The next step is how do we now try and strengthen the steel industry and strengthen the component industry linked to it uh, to create further competitiveness. That's great. I mean, Paul, is, is the steel industry something that uh, worries you in the value chain and local steel versus imported steel? It, it, it does worry us um, because we do have one of our operations that's very dependent on uh, the steel. But, um, you know, it's no different to the gas challenge that's mm -hmm. coming. It's no different to the transnet challenges we work with every day. Uh, Eskim uh, at least is is recovered. Um, so you know these are the things we deal with. So lots to worry about. The the issue is um, you know to 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 make sure we can find alternatives. To make sure we can work together. Uh, and obviously NACAM is is really really useful in in helping coordinate efforts uh, in this regard. But these these are the challenges of you know, working in uh, South Africa. Cool. <clears throat> so I see you are we're coming to the close of time. So maybe just uh, make some quick closing comments from uh, Justin, um, Paul and Beth. So Justin, your maybe closing remarks. Going uh, just looking at uh, at some of the uh, at some of the questions that were posed around the um, uh, for example, Chinese brands in, in South Africa and, and sort of pressures in the market. And I don't I don't have an issue with regards to competition in the market. Uh, I, what does worry me is that there is a clear clamping down on deemed unfair competition in developed markets, yeah. where the subsidies that the Chinese are giving their vehicle assemblers are seen to create an unlevel playing field. Mm -hmm. And what worries me is that markets like South Africa are going to be the perfect place to dump product. So I really hope that our authorities are closely monitoring the value of these landed vehicles and ensuring that uh, our market is not being further damaged by an unfair uh, playing field in our domestic market. I do policy work in the clothing industry. And um, I mean, the stuff that comes into this country, stuff that should cost 100 Rand gets declared at 5 Rand. And I'm not giving an, ex an exception. The average for the whole year will be five rand when it should be 100 rand. So the, the ad valorem duty means nothing. And it really worries me when I see this massive surge of imports coming into our domestic market, whether our customs officials are sleeping at the wheel or whether they are actually ensuring that there's a fair valuation of this product coming into our market. Otherwise, uh, our CBU duty protection means nothing. That's my big, big concern at the moment. Thanks, Justin. Paul, your closing comments? Yeah, Dwayne, um, you know, this is this is a classic of, uh, you know, public private uh, working together here to to get it done, solving the issues together. You know, we, we 
put a lot of effort when I was previously in the steel industry. There's a lot of effort around, we've got to save manufacturing. Manufacturing mm -hmm. creates jobs. This is one of those industries uh, significant to our GDP. Um, and, and it requires a, a collective effort as opposed to an, an individual effort. Yeah. But, uh, you know, confidence, uh, great industry to be in um, and, uh, you know, great track record and, and something South Africa can be proud of. Well, Beth, your closing remarks. Uh, thanks, Ren. I'm going to follow on from what Paul's saying and try to give a bit more of a positive spin. I, I worry sometimes that we get too uh, depressed and, and caught up in the negatives. I think we certainly aren't aware of the challenges. We search, and I think that's a good base to come from. We know what we need to work on. We know what we need to improve. Um, that being said, there are certainly green shoots in, look, I'm biased and coming from the component sector, but the component sector over the last five years, despite so many challenges, has performed relatively well. We've had record exports. We continue to see high levels of capital investment into the sector. Um, we now have multiple OEMs announcing new models uh, coming in the, the next couple of years. And so I don't want to be overly optimistic and say everything is great, but I certainly do think there is some positivity and green shoots are certainly showing. And I think, uh, as Paul said, it's about cooperation. It's about all the kind of key stakeholders working together, uh, taking what we've now spent a lot of time today discussing in terms of the challenges and how do we build from those challenges and make, make the opportunities that will more so realize those opportunities. Um, so not being foolishly optimistic, but I do think there are green shoots and it's for us to to really capitalize on those. Thanks, Beth. Um, yeah, so th thanks everybody for your time. Um, our speakers today are sh sharing your insights. Um, yeah, hopefully you, all, those, all the attendees got to value. Um, yeah, so now I'd like to uh, hand, hand over back to Shannon to close the session. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Dwayne. Justin, did you have a last comment you wanted to make? Yeah, it's a way, well, yeah I'd like to make one comment. It's yeah. It's a comment that I, I so I was recently in a in a forum with 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 um, some senior government people, and I said South Africa is a bit of an irony because if you were to ask me to build something from scratch in Africa, where would the best place be to make it? And without a doubt, it's still South Africa. Hmm. So we've got the most solid industrial foundation of any African country by a large margin. Hmm. However, if you were to ask me to gauge um, the potential for change, given the experiences of the last 10 to 15 years, this would be the last place I'd want to invest in. Because the the trajectory that we're following is a really negative one. Um, and although we talk positively about these green shoots, I don't see many of them in relation to working with government to be blunt. Um, I see continued um, uh, deterioration in public sector capability, which seriously worries me. But that doesn't mean we don't have a solid foundation to work on. So I think we really are in this betwixt and a between position. We're in an incredibly strong position comparatively, but uh, we have had such a long period of atrophying that I do think we struggle with that positive mindset and dealing with the structural things that we have to deal with if we're going to regain positive momentum. And, and that seems to be the eternal struggle. All right. Well, thanks Justin. for that, Justin. And yeah, we hope that the right people are watching this then. <laughs> but um, yeah, that brings us to the end of our webinar. And I'd like to say thank you to our facilitator, Dwayne Newman, for enabling an engaging and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Justin Barnes from TWIMS, Paul O'Flaherty from Metair Investments Limited, and Beth Dealtree from Narcan. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Metair Investments, SEW Eurodrive and Helaman Titan for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on the automotive industry. Thank you also to everyone who participated in our live Q&A. Our next webinar takes place on the 31st of July at 2 p.m. and will focus on local manufacturing. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you for your time and goodbye. <laughs>